our speaker tonight is certainly one that we are fortunate to have with us this evening. John Horn, Professor John Horn has recently explored the uses of cultural history as a way of opening up new perspectives on the First World War without believing in the exclusivity of any one approach. He is the author and editor of a number of books and over 80 chapters and articles, many relating to the history of war. And he is currently writing and almost finished, as he told me this evening, a history on the French experience of World War I. He's Professor Emeritus of Modern European History at Trinity College, Dublin, Ireland, where he continues to direct the Center for War Studies, and he's visiting professor at Oxford University, a very distinguished scholar, and we appreciate the effort he's made to be with us tonight. Please welcome Professor John Horn. Well, President Boren, uh, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, uh, thank you very much for this kind welcome. And I'd like to particularly thank um, Professor Kevin Butterfield for the invitation here, um, and also um, uh, uh, to, to thank Sarah Searle for organizing the logistics of, of travel here and uh, making this such a wonderful experience. And also my colleague, um, uh, Professor Melissa Stockdale, who's looked after me so well since I arrived. This is an enormous number of people. <laughs> in, in Ireland, where, where I come from, we, we, we think we know and understand and like history. But I'm not sure that we would um, get 900 people um, for a teach-in of this kind. And, and by the way, I'd also like to salute and greet the, the folk downstairs, um, because there are two stories, as it were, to this, uh, to this particular um, uh, meeting. So I have to say that I'm enormously impressed um, by an event such as this teaching. It's a, a sheer pleasure for a historian and a teacher uh, to be able to engage with a public like this and just to have been able to participate and listen during the day to the, uh, uh, to the, to the wonderful expositions and equally the, the, the questions and comments uh, from the audience. Well, my topic this evening is World War I, rethinking the centenary. We are at the midpoint of marking the centenary of the First World War. 18 months after the uh, initial uh, commemorations in 2014, and with momentous dates still ahead. Not least, of course, April 2017, 100 years on from the United States entry into the war. So now seems a good moment to pause for reflection. And that's what I really want to do at the end of this, this long day thinking about World War I, to pause for reflection. And two themes run through what I want to say this evening. The first is what it means, what it might mean to commemorate the past. What do we do when we commemorate the past? And my second theme is the question of how commemoration, whatever we mean by that, relates to historical understanding of the past. Now, commemoration, my first theme, it seems to me speaks to the present. Anniversaries, because we all live in historical time, we may live in other kinds of time, personal time, mythic time, religious time, but certainly since the 18th century, we've all lived in historic time. That's the, the unit in which we count collectively in terms of our societies and states. That's the unit in which we count time. And therefore, anniversaries, centenaries, are the moments when we remember our links with the past, with that historic time, and also when we draw lessons from the past. If we didn't do that, if we didn't draw lessons, I think our public lives and our politics would be the poorer. They would be cut off from one of their primary sources of meaning. But what should the lessons that we draw be when we commemorate? Is it possible to avoid banality, simply commemorating the thing that we can all agree not to disagree on, the lowest common denominator, if you will? And it's here that my second theme comes in, the role of history. History and commemoration are different activities, it seems to me. Certainly, they share the past as a subject, 
But history seeks to deepen understanding of the past by reopening old questions and raising new ones. The present, our present, is constantly constructing an evolving relationship with the past. But if commemoration selects messages for the present, history comes up with new interpretations of the past for its own sake. And while certainly this is the domain of professional historians, history, like commemoration, belongs to all of us. But the question is, what should history, historical scholarship, say to the act of commemoration? And that is my question this evening. What, regarding World War I, should historical scholarship say to the current wave of commemorations on the centenary of the Great War? And in order to answer this question, which is my question for the evening, what I'd like to do is firstly to explore how World War I has been commemorated up until now. And then to suggest some recent trends in work by historians that might indicate how we could interact better, or at least differently, with commemoration. But before I do either of those things, talk about the commemoration of the Great War or recent historical work on it, I think I need to say something for a few minutes about the nature of World War I itself, or, or if you like, my take on this, because you've heard my colleagues speaking from their perspective on this all day. The key point to grasp, I think, is that World War I confirmed the nation state as the chief form of political organization and the main source of political identity in the contemporary world. Now, it's true, Europe 100 years ago had already experienced the ferment of national feeling for over a century since the French Revolution. And the same was true in different ways in North America and in Latin America. And yet, three multinational empires ruled the eastern half of Europe and the Middle East, Habsburg, Austria, Hung Hungary, Romanov, Russia, and the Ottoman Empire. And they all saw themselves as in one way or another being menaced by nationalism. Indeed, one shorthand explanation for the outbreak of World War I in August 1914 is that the issue of how such empires, such multinational empires, might deal with the challenge of the nationality principle, this form fermented a regional conflict between Austria, Hungary, and Serbia, which happened to intersect with the European balance of power between two armed camps. And that intersection uh, of a, a regional conflict between a Serbian nation and a Serbian assertive nationalism and an Austria-Hungary which was concerned as far as possible to avoid um, full recognition of the nationality principle, that turned into a showdown uh, a, a, a question for Austria-Hungary, which, as I say, intersected with the European balance of power and so we had a continental, and then, with Britain, a full European war. But the Europe that emerged from the violence of World War I, four and a half years later, was, as it still is, a Europe of nation states. The new nation states in the East were, of course, locked in conflict over the shattered remains of the dynastic empires that they had replaced Conflicts that prolonged the war, we mentioned this this afternoon, conflicts that prolonged the war until 1923 or 1924. And although, as we've also discussed this afternoon, with World War I, the French and the British empires reached their zenith as they absorbed Germany's colonies and carved up the Ottoman Middle East, as Professor Rogan has demonstrated for us uh, so uh, uh, eloquently, the war also saw the first stirrings of the spirit of national independence in the colonial empires. In 1919, again, as we said this afternoon, as Europeans gathered in Paris under Woodrow Wilson's leadership to remake their world on the basis of national sovereignty and democratic self-determination, colonial intellectuals demanded the extension of these same principles to the empires. My own sense, we could debate this further, I think, is that Woodrow Wilson had never intended uh, those principles to have that kind of reach, that extra European reach. 
And so the colonial intellectuals demanded, whether, wherever they came from, Egypt, India, China, Korea, they demanded the Wilsonian principles be applied in vain. National sovereignty only swept the colonial world after World War II with decolonization. But World War I marked a decisive step in the emergence of the nation state, not just in Europe, but more broadly on the world stage. Now, the drama of World War I was by no means limited to the victory of the nationality principle in Europe. Far from it. For the price paid by all the parties was terrible, and even the victors showed very little triumphalism. This was due to the nature of the military conflict and the sacrifice of the soldiers. World War I, it seems to me, was a tragedy in this sense, that none of the decision makers in 1914 understood what war itself meant. They envisaged it before 1914 as a rational instrument of policy. They imagined it in the light of the Napoleonic Wars a century earlier as a matter of movement, of motion, of decisive battles. And they endowed it with qualities of heroism, honor, and martial masculinity. Most Europeans before 1914 thought that war, however awful, however apocalyptic, as Professor Collins reminded us, that some of them may have thought of it as being, um, uh, 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 that um, uh, 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 nonetheless, that, um, sorry, that Professor Philip Jenkins reminded us this morning um, in his very eloquent lecture, um, that nonetheless, they thought that war would produce a rapid result and that it would leave the world basically unchanged. War was an instrument that you could use to intervene in the world, use it, achieve an end, but the world itself would remain unaltered. Such hubris rapidly met its nemesis in a new kind of warfare whose features had been seen but not understood in earlier wars, the South African War, the Russo-Japanese War, and the two Balkan Wars of 1912 to 1913. These conflicts had hinted at the effect of high explosive shells invented in the 1880s and the difficulty for infantry in attacking under machine gun and heavy artillery fire. War had been industrialized, and for the moment, the advantage lay with the defensive. The war of motion, of movement in 1914, starkly revealed this state of, affair, this state of affairs. Pitting men against firepower resulted in carnage, and the losses in the first five months in the autumn of 1914 were the highest the highest of the entire conflict. Digging trenches was a logical response to this new reality. It was a form of self-defense, but it turned the war from one of movement, which is what everyone had anticipated, to one of siege. Now, you might say siege warfare is as old as war itself, but traditionally, one side defends a strong point while the other attacks. This, however, was a new kind of siege warfare in open country in which each side besieged the other, both attacking and defending. And with coalition warfare, it occurred not just in the west, but also in the east, the south between Austria and Italy, in Turkey at Gallipoli, and in the Balkans in Macedonia. By mid-1915, Europe was a continent under mutual siege, each side was both Trojan and Greek. Now, how to break this siege, how to restore the advantage to the offensive, remained a problem without solution. They exist in history, problems without solutions, just as they do in our own present. The difficulty lies in recognizing them. World War I generals were not stupider than we are. They searched for a solution by endless renewed offensives, supported by developments in industrial combat, artillery, air power, tanks, chemical weapons, without ever finding the tactical or the technical wooden horse for their modern siege of Troy. The balance of advantage gradually swung back to the offensive, but only decisively so with German Blitzkrieg, lightning war, in 1939 to 41. In 1918, victory was due as much to attrition to the wearing down of the enemy as to the final 
Allied advance. Victor or vanquished, however, the price was more than 10 million military dead. But the drama of World War I did not stop with this military tragedy. For winning a war of attrition, which, if you like, was the modern form of that other tactic in classic sieges, which is to starve the enemy out, this meant mobilizing all resources, economic, political, cultural, and psychological, in order to crush the enemy. And the enemy in question was not just the military, but also civilians, who were now deprived of vital goods, including food, by naval blockade or submarine warfare. Moreover, as early as August 1914, and then with increasing intensity, aircraft were used to bomb civilians in an effort to break their morale. Of course, aviation was only in its infancy, and the means were limited. But the crucial point is that from the very start, contemporaries imagined bombing such as that of Coventry in 1941 or Dresden in 1945. The ultimate challenge of such a war was the mobilization of the popular will. Political authority, the capacity for sacrifice, psychological resilience, these were the deep resources of the nations and empires involved. It was on these, as much as on the military, that their fate turned. As it happened, the dynastic empires proved less able to sustain this challenge. Austria-Hungary, Tsarist Russia, and Ottoman Turkey crumbled from within. Nation states proved more resilient, but even the liberal democracies, Britain and France, which together with Italy and the USA, formed the alliance opposing the central powers once the Bolsheviks had taken Russia out of the war in 1917, even they had to remobilize themselves for what Clemenceau called the last quarter of an hour. In other words, the side that would win would be the side that believed it could win for 15 minutes longer than its opponent. This was psychological mobilization. This effort, this tremendous effort in the last two years of the war helped radicalize Europe, and even more during the conflicts that continued until 1923, the, uh, the, uh, the, the, the revolutions, the counter-revolutions, and the ethnic violence, which wasn't over until 1923. The rivalry between communism, fascism, and democracy, a democracy precisely redefined by Woodrow Wilson's crusade, was not, it seems to me, an indirect consequence of World War I. The war was its crucible. Without it, without victory or defeat, this radicalization would not have happened, or at least would have happened differently. After the war, people knew that they lived in a world that had been transformed. Hence the invention of a nostalgic past, the French Belle Époque, the last golden summer of Edwardian England, an idealized Kaiserreich, or empire, for defeated Germany. But catharsis, if such were possible, could only come by aligning the memory of the war with the construction of the future. And the framework of both in the post-war world, in Europe at least, was precisely national. Hence, a war which, as I hope I've just suggested, was transnational in its dynamics, was remembered and commemorated above all by nation states whose triumph in Europe it had consolidated. The memory was above all national. So having briefly tried to sum up from my perspective what the First World War entailed, now let me outline some of the consequences of this predominantly national memory in the second part of what I want to say before I go on in conclusion to suggest how recent historical scholarship might allow us to reinterpret the European and the global dimension of the war and even perhaps include it in commemorations. The memory of World War I is to this day very unequal. It's strongest in the Western allied nations, above all Britain and France. This is also true of the former dominions. Australia, New Zealand, and Canada forged their titles of nationhood at Gallipoli and Ypres, on the Somme and in Palestine. Of course, as everywhere, World War II eclipsed its predecessor. 
But since in Europe, World War II was mainly an Eastern Front war, the French and the British military dead remained higher, in fact, the highest in their histories, for World War I. World War II is remembered in a very different register, a just war and a national epic for the British, rather like in the United States, a divisive trauma for the French. But because of this difference, and because World War II still shapes the world we live in, World War I in Britain and France has come to symbolize sacrifice, mass death, war as tragedy, what the British poet Wilfred Owen called the pity of war. The German case is the exact opposite. Of course, as uh, uh, Professor Perry reminded us this afternoon, German historians have worked on World War I, but the public has shown far less interest in Britain and, than, in, than in Britain and France, even if the position has altered somewhat since 2014. This nuanced change is indicated by the success of Christopher Clarke's book, The Sleepwalkers, which was all about how war came about in 1914, and was a runaway success in Germany, to everybody's surprise. But I think in part, it's a very fine book, but in part because it, it exonerates Germany of any special responsibility for the outbreak of the war in 1914. In fact, it talks about Germany relatively little, whereas West German opinion since the 1970s had accepted German responsibility for the First World War. If we're responsible for the Second World War, we may as well be responsible for the First as well. And Clark's book really upended that and um, helped create a kind of a wave of, 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 of surprising interest in, in Germany over the last two years in the war. But in general, uh, compared to Britain and France, the visibility of World War I is low in Germany. And I don't think this should surprise us. Germany, down to 1939, obsessed over a conflict that had cost it defeat and more than two million military dead. Subsequently, German memory has focused on the far greater catastrophe of World War II and the Holocaust. The death of six million Germans, definitive defeat, and the country's division for nearly half a century turned World War I into the mere herald of the real tragedy. Now, I could multiply endlessly these differences in the national memory of the Great War. Hungary is still haunted by the Treaty of Trianon, of 1920 because it lost the territory, especially to Romania, that remains lost to Hungary today. And so to this very day, monuments to Trianon are being erected in Hungary. The Soviet Union, as Professor Stockdale knows much better than I do, the, the Soviet Union frowned on commemoration of a war that it denounced as imperialist and whose sole importance was to have engendered the Bolshevik Revolution. Only now is a revived aggressive Russian nationalism fostered by Vladimir Putin recovering the memory of the two million war dead. And here in the USA, while World War I was the small conflict between the two big ones, the Civil War and World War II, it's always seemed to me that it occupies a disproportionately minor place in national awareness owing to precisely the sorts of things that uh, we heard about at lunchtime today, uh, the uh, isolationist reaction by public opinion in the 1920s, the sense that somehow uh, uh, Americans had been betrayed and manipulated by wily Europeans to stepping onto the, uh, 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 the international stage. In reality, as we've been saying all day, the war was not only the moment when America stepped onto the world stage, but it never left it again at least in economic and philanthropic terms, and its role in the interwar years shows that. But let me just cite the Polish case, because it illustrates a wider issue, which is how you frame in national memory the experience of a war which for many people preceded the creation of the nation state, even if it helped produce that nation state. Poland, as you know, had been divided since the end of the 18th century by Germany, Austria, and Hungary. And three and a half million Poles were enrolled in the armies of all these powers in 1914, with those in the Russian army fighting against Poles in the German and the Austrian armies. Some 400,000 Polish soldiers died. Independent Poland resulted from World War I. But the new Polish state derived its foundation myth not from the Great War, 
but from the wars of 1919-1920, when it fought for its survival and for its frontiers against Lithuania and the Ukraine, before then defeating the Red Army at the gates of Warsaw. Interwar Poland went on to become, ironically, the custodian of the former Eastern Front, which lay on its territory. But if you visit the National War Memorial in Warsaw, you will find that the Polish unknown soldier doesn't come from any of the battles in which Polish soldiers died during the war, though they're all listed there, but comes instead from the Battle of Vuv, fought against the Ukraine in May 1919. For Poland, World War I preceded the nation state, and World War I in Poland remains a forgotten war to this very day. Now, these national memories, or their absence, have played a key role in the centenary commemorations of World War I thus far. Each of the ceremonies that we saw in the summer of 2014 was organized by a nation, albeit with others invited. The European Union was mainly absent. So too were the Russians, of course, a major power in 1914, let alone the Serbs, whose memory of the, of the war has become rather suspect in the light of the 1990s and the wars in the former Yugoslavia. And who commemorated the Habsburg War? Certainly not Hungary, and barely even Austria. Exactly the problem. The Austrians had to kind of distill out of an experience which was a multinational imperial experience of the Great War, the experience of an Austrian nation which didn't exist at the time. Now, I don't want to decry the efforts that were made uh, in 2014, either to address the place of pre-nation state peoples in the war, from Poles to West Africans to Indians to Chinese and so many others, or the efforts that were made to go beyond the national level. Indeed, I can think of a fine monument that does both of those things, incorporates the non-national peoples and goes beyond the national level, and this is the so-called ring, ring of Memory in northern France. Realized by the architect Philippe Prost, this beautiful elliptical ring of bronze tablets, you have to imagine it, a couple of hundred meters in diameter, and then these, um, like the half-open pages of a book, these bronze uh, tablets which are about 12 feet high, um, uh, uh, and it stands atop the hill of Notre Dame de Lorette, which was much fought over, on this sector of the front, right next to a basilica from the 1920s that records the exclusively French sacrifice in the fighting. Prost's ring, by contrast, which was inaugurated by President Hollande on the 11th of November 2014, simply lists the names of all the men who died in that part of the front in alphabetical order and without reference to rank or nationality all 525,000 of them. Still, the official commemorative accent has been national, our sacrifice, even if it's one that, acknowledged, that acknowledges the sacrifice of others. And this has also been the tendency, if in more complex ways, in the public sphere of museums, the media, and so on. And I don't know, it's an open question, whether the judgment will be any different when it comes to the USA in 2017. I mean, the, the example which Professor Capozzolo gave us of Frank, Frank uh, Buckles, the, um, the, the, the final uh, American soldier um, veteran to have died, um, and, 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 and the comment which I think is absolutely right and appropriate that you know, now the final veterans have gone and remembrance is up to us. And of course remembrance happens in a national framework, in an American framework or a French framework. But the question is, whether, as in Prost's ring of memory, it should also happen in other frameworks as well. And this, I think, makes my key question all the more important. How do such national commemorative efforts relate to recent scholarship on the war, and thus to what we might commemorate? And I want to answer this question by referring in this last part of my talk to three perspectives which have been opened up by historians since the 75th anniversary of World War I. Now, not surprisingly, that particular anniversary passed unnoticed. The world had other matters on its mind in 1989, 
the year that saw the bicentenary of the French Revolution and the end of communism. Yet this, I would submit, 1989 was also one of those years when time shifts on its axis and in so doing changes our relationship with the past, including, in this case, with World War I. For 1989 closed a period of contemporary history that had opened with 1945. Suddenly, the beginning of the short 20th century, with its two world wars and ideological clashes, came into sharp focus, famously formulated, of course, by Eric Hobsbawm in his book, The Age of Extremes, 1914 to 1991. With the reunification of Germany, a lost Middle Europa, Middle Europe, resurfaced, restoring Berlin as Germany's capital and reconnecting the Habsburg lands. The brutal wars in the former Yugoslavia, especially Bosnia, not only returned to the crisis that occasioned World War I, with the siege of Sarajevo from 1991 to 1996, but also revived the specter of ethnic conflict, ethnic cleansing, and violence uh, against civilians that had marked both world wars. And finally, the emergence of the new Asian economies reinforced the sense amongst Europeans, certainly, that they had a reduced place in the world, something that they first realized during and as a result of 1914, 1918. The first perspective in recent research concerns what I would term the genealogies of violence that explain the place of World War I in the short 20th century. In this context, let me just raise again briefly the matter of the causes of the war. The debate aroused by Christopher Clarke's book and others shows that the responsibility for the war's outbreak still arouses passionate debate. Between the wars, it obsessed both politicians and historians since the interwar order in Europe and further afield turned on the issue of victory and defeat and therefore on allied accusations of German war guilt. It was as if the catastrophe of the conflict was channeled into an arcane, overdetermined debate on the diplomatic history of the July crisis in 1914. But for all the abiding fascination of the origins of the war, What's striking to me, at least, at a century's distance, is the disproportion, the disproportion between the causes of the war, however we explain these, and what resulted from them. It was the war itself that transformed the world of those who had unleashed it, owing to the military stalemate and the kinds of mobilization needed to win it. It was not before, but during the war, that people imagined a total enemy, urged total sacrifice, and even invented the term total war. They also broke the legal norms for the conduct of war by innovations such as gas warfare and by directly targeting civilians with bombardment, starvation, and forced labor in occupied territories. Of course, in order to understand the link with what came after, we have to add the greater war that I've referred to that goes on down to 1923. It's here that the violence born of the war was pursued in Russia by revolution and civil war, in Eastern Europe by new states that disputed borders and ethnic minorities, and in Central Europe by the political crises bred of defeat that afflicted Germany, Austria, and Italy. During this transition, war was adapted to peace. That is what the Bolsheviks did as they based their social expropriation on the war economies of 1914-18 and on the need to win the civil war. It's what Mussolini did when he used paramilitary violence inspired by the war to attack the liberal state. Unlike in the late 18th century, when revolution in America and France changed everything, including war, war, it seems to me, now played that role, changing even revolution the Russian and Chinese versions are unthinkable without it. Perhaps war, the two world wars, were the real revolution of the 20th century. In that sense, World War I unleashed far more than it could resolve, creating genealogies of future violence. The second perspective in recent historical research is that of the soldiers, 
World War I was not the first industrial war, it seems to me. That, that sad distinction belongs to the American Civil War. But it did initiate the world into an era of mass destruction. World War II extended the military violence to civilians, notably with large-scale aerial bombing. But World War II knew no battle more destructive than Verdun, which began almost exactly 100 years ago, or the Somme, let alone the War of Movement in 1914. The soldier's suffering was one of the war's most distinctive features, even as it unfolded. If historians ignored it between the wars in favor of classic military, political, and diplomatic history, that was certainly not true of the veterans who produced a flood of memoir literature, nor was it true of national memories. Our rituals of mass mourning, the minute silence, the unknown soldier, the individual names on the tombstone or monument all come from World War I. The tragedy of the war was framed in terms of national military sacrifice. Someone might be forgiven for thinking that we know all there is to know about the soldier's experience and that it stands securely at the heart of the centenary commemorations. One could get that impression from having watched those national commemorations in 2014. But as soon as we leave the national frameworks, we encounter surprises. Professor Rogan has already referred to the Mesopotamian campaign. When the British troops uh, invaded Iraq in 2003, they were astonished to discover a large Commonwealth War Grave Cemetery at Basra, headquarters of that British expedition against Ottoman Mesopotamia. This, it seems to me, resembled a colonial campaign, not the Western Front, but nonetheless, tens of thousands of men died on it. Many came from the Indian Army, nearly a million, nearly a million of whose soldiers fought abroad. Half a million colonial soldiers fought in the French army, many on the Western Front. Yet, as with Poland, the war is a pre-national memory for India, Algeria, or Senegal. And these countries have, perhaps understandably, shown relatively little interest in a centenary frame outside and in national terms. And if we do know a good deal about the monuments and cemeteries of the Western and even the Italian fronts, that's certainly not the case on the Eastern Front, which is now split between Poland, Belarusia, Ukraine, and the Baltic states. No register, no photographic record even, exists of the cemeteries and the crumbling remnants of monuments in this part of besieged Europe. Even on the Western Front, what motivated the soldiers of World War I remains enigmatic. Were they forced to fight? No doubt. We're dealing in almost every case with conscript armies. Did they agree to remain, to endure to the end? Certainly. For millions of men cannot be forced to fight against their will, as the periodic but limited mutinies that did break out demonstrate. Historians have debated these issues of morale and motivation in the light of new sources and increasingly in a comparative framework. For the point is that the Western Front and the other fronts and what I've termed the mutual siege of Europe was all deeply interactive. It was transnational, and many aspects of the soldier's experience were common. And yet the enigma remains. We in the West are a century removed from the conviction, the loyalty, the willing sacrifice displayed by these communities, national or imperial. The nation in arms has gone. Professionals have replaced conscripts. Who today in the West, who today would accept the military death toll of the Great War, 6,400 deaths a day for four and a half years. The pity of war may be a measure of our own incomprehension. The reverse is the case, however, as far as the civilian victims, my third and last perspective, are concerned. Following, I think, events in the former Yugoslavia and Rwanda in the 1990s, and with a new awareness of universal human rights, these, the civilian victims, seem closer to us now, though for a long time they were hidden from view by the obsession with national military sacrifice. I'm not talking here about civilians on the home front, women, workers. These have always enjoyed some visibility, 
Rather, I mean those directly targeted by military and state violence, often during occupation or as a consequence of xenophobia. These victims did not figure in the national memory framework because they were elsewhere in occupied territories or on the margins as ethnic minorities. And these civilian victims of the Great War have proved one of the most active fields of research since 1989, but they, they remain largely outside national centenary commemorations. Time prevents me from going into detail, but just let me illustrate the point with the Armenian genocide. Now, if we accept the Western bias and the military emphasis of contemporaries at the time of the Great War, then this episode, the Armenian genocide, is doubly marginal. For the victimhood was civilian, and it occurred on the edge of the conflict for many contemporaries. But even if it is true, as, and certainly as it was thought to be true by many contemporaries, that Turkey, as Professor Rogan has put it, was a, a sideshow in World War I, the opposite is not the case. And I share entirely your view on this. This does not mean that World War I was a sideshow for Turkish or Ottoman history. And by the way, that converse logic uh, equally applies to Africa, um, to the Middle East more generally, to East Asia and Japan. For it was in the Ottoman Empire, under the impetus of the radical nationalist Young Turk government, that the political and psychological mobilization that I referred to earlier as the ultimate resource in waging this kind of war, it was there that it was turned against domestic minorities, and notably the Armenians, as the enemy within. Observers such as Britain's Lord Bryce uh, were not fooled. They knew that they were witnessing what Bryce called, quote, the extermination of a people, as more than a million were killed or died in deportation. The tragic fate of the Ottoman Armenians constitutes one of the major genealogies of violence of World War I. The Polish Jewish lawyer, Raphael Lemkin, was sharply aware of this as he formulated the term genocide 30 years later to describe a comparable, though of course not identical, episode in Eastern Europe. Lemkin, as a young law student, in fact, had been in Berlin in 1921 at the trial of the assassin of um, Talat Pasha, one of the um, uh, uh, triumvirate who'd escaped. And what he couldn't understand was that there was a crime of murder for which somebody could be tried, but the crime of mass murder, which the person assassinated had committed, didn't exist on the statute books. And that example was uppermost in his mind when he came to formulate the term genocide in 1943-44 uh, to explain, to describe legally what was happening to the Jews of Europe. If we can overcome our Occidentalism and our focus on military violence, we encounter the stark fact that genocide had a central place in both world wars. Let me conclude. The perspectives opened up by historians on World War I in the last 25 years underline the fact that history and commemoration are not the same thing. Still, there is no reason why, in order to escape the risk of banality that I mentioned at the outset, common commemorators should not incorporate these perspectives into whatever messages they choose to formulate. But the obstacle to doing this, or one of the major obstacles to doing this, is the discrepancy between national memory frameworks and the transnational nature of the war and increasingly of its historiography. At the level of official events, we risk either reinforcing national memory or finding a lowest common denominator in the soldier's suffering in which a kind of sentimentality blurs any idea of the multiple dramas of the war. Fortunately, the encounter between history and commemoration consists of more than official state occasions. It entails rich possibilities in the public sphere, in the arts, museums, the media, education, and indeed precisely in teach-ins such as this. Multinational collaboration is easier here than between states. It's here that we can renegotiate our relationship with this seminal episode and perhaps attempt what might seem blindingly obvious, but which in practice is very hard, namely to write a global history of a global war. <laughs>
But if we choose to do this, we have much to discover and indeed to commemorate in the remaining years of the centenary and beyond. Thank you.